the spiritual aspect about the environment is very rich, dependent on how you treat it. So in my territory, we're born and raised in one area there at Galliano Island. And our dad and grandpa taught the traditional ways and how to care for, for us as we're being born. So we relate to the land by special ritual and it carries on into your life. It's the guarantee you're, you're grounded forever to the land where you're born to. So a lot of the territories we used when we're collecting foods, it was meant to be a uh, it's like conservation. You live in one area, but you take apart your home and you go to another area. That way you guard where you are. You let it become enriched again before you ever go back. But maybe it'll be four to five years before you use it again. For gardening, they had a special tool. It was a lawn stick. Was a three-cornered edge and then when they pierced the ground they were careful not to remove the earth in a huge way so that if you took out wild potatoes you used your little finger to put the little seed that you pulled out with the potato it would have all the other seeds onto it so you would take your little pinky and you would pierce back the earth into the earth and you would replant the seeds. So traditionally that they never used a lot of tools and that's how they respected the earth. When you say how do you respect the earth, that's the way they did it. And so it was the same within the ocean, which is the is like our foods area. It's like a garden, but it's an ocean garden. And the same way they built a rock formation and then they would take in so much clams, so much oysters, they couldn't, because as you know, they swim away, they come in and out, and they're looking for food, so they move around. If you go to plant them and put them in a certain area, they're not gonna stay if they don't like it they will move away. Same way with the forest. If they don't like it, they'll move on. So not always do you see them when you go to plant it. Is it going to survive? It might not survive, depending on what's there. So the old traditional ways is how I help to, uh, say, replenish. It has to replenish. So the traditional ways are the kindest and most friendly to the earth. So you're not removing with a bulldozer or a, a backhoe. You know, how unfriendly is that? So the traditional ways, I work with the Conservancy. I don't know if I'm allowed to use their name, but I go there and I tell them, uh, I work with them all every summer and they go and they replenish if they fell if they fell a tree they do it by the way we do it by removing the roots so you undo the roots and you like the fir tree is the shallowest of roots it's easy to take out the roots so go to the conservancy they'll show you it actually can happen and so if you go to remove a cedar skin, you only do it the width of your hand. So when I go with our group out to harvest cedar skin, this is the width that I take from the tree so it don't die. Why do we do all that? Because we have a future to look to. Our future is, is you who we're speaking to today, or we could go to an elementary school and show them how to pull the skin of the tree without harming it, 
that way it can heal back as it's growing. <coughs> so not only do I speak to adults, I speak to elementary level. So they, they learn, they're willing to learn, and they listen very well. So that's the part that I like about our future. They are called Smanaim, our future generation. So if we're to fall a cedar tree, it's going to be 800 years old before we actually do that. So in tradition, I would not like to be one that would fell trees. If you do, I'm going to be there to speak to you about it. And I do it very gently. And I respect and honor the way you do. So I did just very recently to a home on the island. So I said, this is devastating. I can't even imagine how we could even allow that to happen to fell trees. So it's really within me to to speak about it. And I would like to do a healing ceremony to it. So I did one on Galliano Island. Uh, it was devastated in one area by a creek. So we, I went in to sing. So what my friend Carol Wall, she's a professor of Emily Carr Institute. She's just recently retired. She called me in, so I said, yes, I'll come and help you. So I went in there and sang some songs and uh, said some traditional words for her to help <coughs> heal. And uh, that way she had comfort. She know that the earth is a spiritual place. And as you know, the earth <coughs> you have within you a womb when you're a lady and you bear the children to this earth. You are the provider of life to this earth. So the earth is the womb of our human beings that live here and all living creatures. If we harm you, we're harming the earth. So that very teaching to itself is if you harm a lady, you're harming the whole earth. So my teachings is about that. So when we take care of you, we're taking care of the earth. And the earth will then replenish and feed you who needs to be fed almost what hours of the day do you need to eat. And we need to see you through in your life and my life. And all living things so that they could be sustained to live here on the earth. And it's that reciprocity, the practice thereof, whether it's spiritual or physical in nature, so that we respect and honor your life and all living things. That's the usual traditional teachings. Talk to us when we're five to eight years old, we're already learning about marriage, how to be married. So those things, we are married to the earth because of that concept of the earth being the womb and whatever it gives you is going to keep you alive. The way you treat it is important. So a lot of my talks about the natural world are, are the teachings of my dad and my grandpa and my great grandpa who ran his big house in the fashion that I'm talking about to you today. Why would I say to you today? Because I need you all. And in an intellectual way, you're learning about it in studies, where us, before we left home, when we got married, we had to learn it. Because if I don't learn it, I won't know how to treat you. I'm not going to treat you well. And my dad said, if I'm treating you well, you're going to go out, you're going to treat the other people well. And then from there, we just continue. In actual language, we're building bridges to you. 
and we need you today because in this academic setting you're going to learn about it. Things we didn't write down, my great grandpa didn't write it down, he taught it and it was intergenerational. So it's the importance about uh, how they developed their brain. They taught us at a very young age how to be and how to relate to the land. So I, I'm not harming it. So my future generations of our families can enjoy the earth just the way you would in your space. And we honor the space you live in. So here I call Victoria Thomas. It's the Sangish Nation land. I honor them for accepting us here to be learning in this area. And we're building bridges to the land and to the people here. So you have a space down there where my son graduated from here. So we went down to touch base in the area where they have the gathering place. And we also go to the park and enjoy the setting there, the way the past, our generations, our ancestry taught us how to respect. So we always come back and visit, not harming it, but just to come and enjoy the beauty of it. It looks different from the way they told us stories in my area. <coughs> They don't allow development too much because you see the conservancies looking after it the way they know best <coughs> from the teachings. So they're my allies, they're my friends. Siatia, we call it. We're going to become friends so we can relate or be a relative to the earth. So it's the concept of the word relative siya or yaita iyaita so that's the very word in a language so i could hear you lots of language so i'm going to stop there in case you can think of some questions for me later on i say uh, i lift my hands to you in honor you're willing to come here to hear us today take your time and and listen to us so I honor you, your presence, and the time you've given me. I say, uh, thank you, Florence. We have some time for questions or comments if anybody has anything to ask or to share at this point. <coughs> Yes, they do. They're a dialect of Salish, straight Salish, not Coast Salish, but we can relate. There's a revival in the area here about the language, and it's, so there's, I think the late Dave Elliott uh, left a lot of dictionaries, and Mrs. Claxton, the Grandma Claxton, she was a speaker of five languages. And I'm a speaker of two, I feel really little <laughs> compared to the way our ancestry spoke five to seven languages. So for example, uh, you would be able to understand uh, someone from Sioux? I can. When I went to tribal journeys, they speak all different dialects on the way. It's 265 miles to get to where we needed to go. And I understood pretty well all the way down, even to the lady, the elder from Hope. I did understand that it was the odd word that I you know is, is rich, it's richer, and because we speak at a common language now, not the upper class language, so it affects us in a different way. Thank you. Yes? I, my name's Nathan Bennett. Um, I, I'd be incredibly honored if you come visit my twins sometime and uh, hear them laugh. Um, the, the question that I have is, is about, um, in, in your tradition, 
how um, how knowledge and, and, and ethics are 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 separated or, or intertwined um, when you talk about the, the the teachings. It seems like there's a, a real a real overlap between the between the two that maybe is 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 quite different for us. Right. Up uh, here, uh, we have ethics in the the way we relate to each uh, segment. Say, if you want to look at uh, what's in the ocean that has a different type of prayer, a different way to treat the water, a different way to treat the rivers. And there's a different uh, concept that used to be done by the shamans to prepare the river for the entrance of humans and the salmon so that you have a special prayer for it, a special way to set your nets if it's on a reef a different way to set a trap, it has to have the prayers, and a different way to harvest from the local forest, the trees, when you're taking medicine and plants, so that it can replenish a certain way to pick it, and a certain prayer, because it's considered always equal, male and female, and even when they play games, there's a male and female uh, figure so that it's always creating balance as we go along. A male salmon and a female salmon, you can't have one without the other. So there is ethics to it. Thank you for the question. Time for one more. Thank you, Mr. Lallin, for sharing with us so much. Okay. And I'm just wondering, if you can share your memories of being a little girl and how you learned as a little girl how these things were taught to you. Okay, I'll move up closer to the mic. As, uh, when I was uh, speaking to my dad about it, he was my teacher. And uh, I can remember when my grandma carried me away, she also groomed <coughs> us in the traditional ways. How to be, how to pick berries, how to treat everything in the forest. And I went back because I was curious, why me? Because my sibling, she's a bit offended that I have a good memory of everything. <laughs> all the teachings, all the names, all the language and genealogy of how they, how they groomed us, how to be still so we can learn and it helped us develop our brain as little people. So when I asked how old I was when they, my grandma carried me away because I could remember her carrying me in her left arm, I had burnt my hand as a, I was crawling on the floor and I touched something hot on the stove and it took away all my skin on my hand. So she took me home. Mom said I was nine months old. And that's how far back I can remember. So they do groom you to, because of your, the way you behave as a baby. And then so I have dreams because my dad had a ritual how to take care of the afterbirth and uh, when he went to put it away, it's relating to a tree, and the tree will look after me when I grow up. So with that teaching, my dreams, I'll go back to the place where I was born. So at two years old, when my sister was born, they sent me out of the home. When she was born, she cried out and I laughed, because I knew that was gonna be my best buddy. <laughs> So that's two years old. So a lot of my memory is rich, and there's some negative aspects to it, but it overcomes it by those memories. Okay. Bye, Chuck.